Back in August, a little scare was sparked among the film community when a report went around claiming that Disney would cease production of physical 4K media for its entire catalog, including 20th Century Fox Productions. Thankfully, this ended up being denied by a spokesperson, who said that each release is simply examined on a case-by-case -case basis to determine what kind of formats are best for it. It was a relief that the initial report was wrong, but it made some people realize that having the choice of owning physical media taken from them is pretty frightening. Disney may have denied any intention of abandoning discs now, but who's to say they'll stick to that two years from now? Or five? Or even ten? What's really stopping them from making all of their future releases exclusive to Disney Plus? Beyond that, what's stopping them from arbitrarily vaulting releases and possibly charging a premium to see them? The whole discussion made me ruminate a bit on the topic of availability regarding all types of media, and it reminded me of one huge issue in the video game industry, a severe lack of preservation efforts. Video games are a fairly young medium compared to the likes of film, but has suffered a fair share of similar growing pains. To put it bluntly, the industry has been doing a god-awful job to ensure the continued existence of games both old and reasonably new. Many titles are under threat of being lost to time for various reasons, and the only thing that prevents their total extinction is piracy. One of the more recent events that made me feel strongly on the topic of video game piracy was something that happened back in August 2018 the closure of Emu Paradise, a very popular emulation and ROM hosting website that was known for having probably the largest library of ROMs and ISOs of any public mainstream site. It's actually still accessible to this day, so you can see just how big its catalog was, but you can't download anything from it anymore. The big reason why it closed down was due to a declaration from Nintendo, who said that they would no longer play nice with piracy sites by sending a cease and desist, and would instead go straight to suing from the get-go. Nintendo is known for being fiercely protective of their intellectual properties, going out of their way to smack down every fan game they're made aware of, regardless of the creator's intent to release them for free. They've cease and desisted so many projects over the years that going into detail about them all would be enough material for a separate video. Understandably, this threat of a lawsuit frightened the owners of Emu Paradise, and out of self-preservation, they stopped their hosting services and disabled downloads. Of course, Nintendo is in their right to do this for games that they own and still actively distribute. But because of how ridiculously huge the website's library was, Nintendo-owned titles still made up only a small portion of it. Many games on Emu Paradise were old and so obscure that piracy is pretty much the only way they'll ever see the light of day again. It goes without saying, Emu Paradise isn't the only ROM hoster on the internet, and private hosters probably have even larger catalogs. But Emu Paradise was the easiest to access, which meant a lot to people who weren't particularly internet savvy or only had a passing interest in emulation. So how does a game become borderline lost like so many? Well, there are a few common factors. A lot of games from the NES and SNES eras were based on or featured licenses that almost certainly are not active anymore. Some games have developers and publishers who have simply closed down since then, rendering them abandonware and thus kept functional and accessible only by fans who still actually care. A lot of games are just niche titles that have never been released outside of Japan, and likely never will, even if they're still active franchises. In most cases, a game simply reaches end-of-life status, with publishers seeing them as a non-viable source of revenue, and thus support is cut off. It's easy to assume that every company always keeps some type of backup developer copy somewhere for all of their games, but sadly, that's just painfully naive. The truth is more complicated than that. Perhaps most tragically of all, some games are doomed to never see an updated re-release because of lost source codes, which is a shockingly common occurrence. Last year, Square Enix made a commitment to preserve their entire history of games and make them available digitally, but it proved to be difficult because some titles have lost source codes. President and CEO Yosuke Matsuda stated in an interview with Game Informer, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but in some cases we don't know where the code is anymore, 
It's very hard to find them sometimes because back in the day, you just made them and put them out there and you were done. You didn't think of how you were going to sell them down the road. Sometimes customers ask, why haven't you released that game yet? And the truth of the matter is, it's because we don't know where it has gone. To prove Matsuda's point further, let's go back and take a look at Kingdom Hearts. It's not as old as, say, Final Fantasy 1 or Dragon Warrior, but it turns out that a significant portion of the game's master assets had been lost, which meant ripping them straight out of the finished game in order to create the HD Remix version. In an E3 2013 interview, director Tetsuya Nomura clarified, Kingdom Hearts 1 was created a long, long time ago, so actually the original data was missing already. It was lost, so we had to research and we had to dig out from the actual games available and recreate everything for HD. We had to recreate all the graphics, and it was actually not that easy. Another famous example of lost source code is Silent Hill 2 and 3. Now you may be thinking, but didn't those games get re-released for an HD collection? And you're right, they did, but those re-releases were not based on the final retail versions of those games. They were based on older, incomplete versions because the retail version source codes were gone. This is why the HD collection was plagued with bugs, graphical issues, and frame rate issues the original releases didn't have. So basically, if you want to play a good version of Silent Hill 2 or 3 upscaled to HD resolutions, your choices are either waiting for Konami to develop a complete remake of each game, or just pirating it and letting software-based emulation do the work. And no, you can't buy these games new anywhere. Thanks to those lost source codes, the original versions of Silent Hill 2 and 3 are not available on any digital storefront today. They're not on the PlayStation Store, they're not on Xbox Live, they're not on the Nintendo eShop, they're not on Steam. Anywhere. If you insist on spending money for them, your only choice is to buy them used, which means you'll need 20-year-old hardware to play them, or you'll just end up putting them in a computer and playing them through an emulator anyway. And since you're buying used, none of your money even goes to the people who made the game. Sadly, lost source codes tend to be one of the more abrupt and permanent ends to a game's commercial presence. Then there's end-of-life status, which is typically an accepted part of the lifespan of a game. Not every title can be a moneymaker for years on end, especially if superior, feature-rich sequels come out that are considered better and the prior game's online community moves to them. Thus, in some cases, it takes only a few years for certain games to hit end of life, where they're unceremoniously taken off of digital platforms and the production of physical copies is quietly ceased. However, an end of life declaration can be something far more heinous for games that can only be played online, whether they're competitive shooters or sprawling MMOs. Not only does the status mean a cease of production and availability, it also means the total death of the community and closure of servers, so no one will be able to log in and play, regardless of how much time or money they spent on the game. So how is this solved? Are longtime players doomed to accept all of their lost investment in the game? Not necessarily. Through the sheer passion and hard work of particularly loyal players, a lot of online games are given a second win thanks to the existence of private, fan-run servers. Games like The Sims Online, Asheron's Call, and Warhammer Online are all kept alive today thanks to devout players putting in the time and effort to keep things running, and typically for no reward other than the sake of it. They update the games regularly and maintain servers that have hundreds, sometimes even thousands of active players logged in at any given time of day. And this isn't even limited to online only or even PC games. Demon Souls for the PlayStation 3 had its own servers shut down in 2018, rendering all online related capabilities and features inaccessible, though the rest of the game worked fine. However, within a week after the shutdown, private servers began to emerge, and they've been kept up since then. A particularly special case of private servers is Star Wars Galaxies, which had officially closed in 2011, but had received multiple different types of fan-made content, including an emulated version while the game was still supported that rolled back certain updates by reverse engineering the game client and writing a server that connects to the emulation. In 2013, the game's source code was leaked and found itself in the hands of players who not only took the opportunity to utilize it in keeping the game alive, but put in the extra work to fix bugs and straighten out unfinished code, 
Right this moment, Star Wars Galaxies is being run by fans solely out of love for the game, and they're just as organized and hardworking as the developers ever were, constantly putting out content updates and fixes for the sake of the community. The big caveat to these fan servers is the fact that they're usually run and maintained without express permission from developers, so despite the work that goes into them, they're walking a very thin line of legality especially Star Wars Galaxies, which is running on source code that they technically shouldn't have. However, they're still typically left alone because of their obvious goodwill, and because it would be immensely controversial to try and slap down efforts of fans supporting a game that the devs can no longer support themselves. Thus, not only does piracy preserve the existence and accessibility of single-player games, it also maintains the life of games that literally cannot be played without internet access at all. Some of you might be thinking, well, what about the public domain? Surely these older games will enter it sooner rather than later, right? And that's a good question. The answer is simple. Copyright. According to MyAbandonware.com, over 16,000 video games released between 1978 and 2017 are abandonware, and freely shared with people out in the open with no one to stop them, but they aren't officially in the public domain meaning they're stuck in this limbo where anyone can play them for free on their computer, but they can't be picked up and distributed to other platforms, such as consoles, by anyone, because they're still under copyright. It is possible to manually release a game into the public domain, usually by a person who programmed it, but the process happening automatically is another issue entirely. In the United States, copyright lasts 95 years after publication for corporate authorship, which means something made by work for hire as opposed to a singular author. This is an extremely long time in the scope of the video game industry, which has only been around for a little over half that length. The first commercial video game console was the Magnavox Odyssey, which launched in September 1972. That means games that aren't already placed in the public domain manually won't be there until at least 2067. It begs the question of who copyright laws even serve, because they seem to favor large corporations who want an iron grip around their intellectual properties for as long as possible, more than they favor the little guy. And, as a matter of fact, they kind of do. At the beginning of this video I brought up Disney, and that wasn't a coincidence. I didn't talk about them just as an introduction statement. They're actually at fault for why copyright lasts so long. Confused? Well, let's take a little detour so I can explain. I'm about to give you a history lesson on American legislation. From 1976 up until the mid-90s, copyright in the United States for corporate authorship lasted for 75 years. In 1997, the Copyright Term Extension Act was introduced, which would add an additional 20 years to that time limit. This is something that Disney desperately wanted because their copyright on Mickey Mouse was going to be over in 2003, which would put the character in the public domain. They wanted to prevent that and thus they began to relentlessly lobby for the act to pass, with CEO Michael Eisner and other executives contributing $94,054 to Democratic members of Congress and $62,932 to Republican members of Congress, totaling to $156,968, which is pocket lint compared to how much Disney makes in a year. Obviously, the act passed, and now Disney properties, along with every piece of media created by corporate authorship since 1964, was under copyright for 95 years, all because Disney wanted to maintain an iron grip around their mouse and all it cost them was a handful of chump change. Copyright laws are unfortunately very vague and are products of their time, written and legislated in an era before the internet became widespread. It's easy to see why big companies might want to abuse copyright to make sure they never lose their most valuable intellectual properties. Meanwhile, smaller companies come and go within those 95 years, bearing a greater chance that their work will be lost to time, especially if they aren't purchased by a larger entity. It's common in the game industry for a publisher to own a new IP created by a developer they do not own, and therefore it's not up to the people who actually made the game to decide how to distribute it, even if the game is old and the IP hasn't been used in years. But regardless of an IP's current activity, some companies have been able to heavily mitigate the threat of irrelevancy and lack of availability that many old games suffer from by officially making them open source or releasing the game's source code after end-of-life status is reached. 
When a game does this, typically new life is breathed into it thanks to waves of fan-made content, and it can add years or even decades to a game's longevity, without anyone needing to resort to full-blown piracy. Probably the best example of this that I can possibly give is Doom. The original Doom and Doom 2 have both stood the test of time thanks to official mod support and eventual release of the Doom engine source code in 1997, only three years after the release of Doom 2. The first Doom was already distributed as shareware with the release of its first episode in 1993, and immediately after, players began modding the game, with utilities for doing so coming out barely over a month after launch. ID Software facilitated and encouraged this by organizing game assets into files called WADs, which allowed easy and quick access to things like levels, graphics, and other crucial data. Players modify this data and release their own WADs that others can use to experience new content. This was allowed at the behest of co-programmers John Carmack, who is known for being a staunch advocate of open source software, and John Romero. Devout Doom fans have been creating and releasing their own content non-stop for decades, guaranteeing the continued relevancy of a 27-year-old game. The size of WADs can vary from a few new levels to megawads that rival the size of a commercial title and things called total conversions, which essentially turn Doom into a completely different game with new mechanics. The creation of WADs even became a foot in the door for some modders to eventually enter game development, including people who would go on to be hired by id Software themselves. With ongoing support for mods and access to the source code, these older titles have been able to very effectively sidestep the issue of eventually fading away to time. You may assume, well, at least this is a problem of the past, current day games shouldn't have these availability issues, right? Sadly, that's also not the case. Even this far into the 21st century, games are still being delisted from digital storefronts, oftentimes with no sign of ever returning. As a matter of fact, as I began writing the first draft of this video's script, The Sinking City by developer Frogwares was taken off of various storefronts due to legal disputes with the publisher. And the game launched barely over a year ago. It's still available for purchase through a handful of official means, and Frogwares does intend to have it back up on the stores it was removed from eventually, but the game came dangerously close to being wiped out without any advance notice. There's a website aptly named delistedgames.com which currently lists over 1,000 games no longer available for purchase, including over 100 games released on current generation platforms. As you may expect, a common reason for their removal outside of end-of-life status is licensing issues. An example is the Ace Combat games, likely being removed due to expired licenses with aircraft manufacturers. Then you have cases such as Afterfall Insanity and Afterfall Reconquest, which were taken down due to lawsuits from Epic Games over unpaid royalties. The developer has since declared bankruptcy, meaning these games will likely never come back. Sometimes, however, delisted games eventually do come back, such as the recently announced Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which was originally delisted in 2014. And if they don't come back, then usually if you bought the game before their delisting, you can still re-download them, as being delisted does not mean they were removed from store servers. However, as with a lot of things in this video, that's not always the case. Dodonpachi Resurrection, a bullet hell by renowned shmup developers Cave, was released on the Xbox 360 in the West by Rising Star Games. But in July of this year, they revealed that, due to their terms with Cave expiring, the game would no longer be available for download, even for people who bought it. Meaning wasted money for those who purchased the game in the past, but deleted it off their hard drive since then. Thankfully, it's been re-released on Steam thanks to Dakika Games, but not all games are so lucky to see a second win like this. Delisted Games features an extinct list which are games that were only released digitally but are no longer available for purchase. Meaning you can't even buy these games used because they were never put on a disc to begin with. Thus, piracy is literally the only option to obtain them. A lot of them are niche, obscure, or independent creations made by studios who have probably come and gone and don't have the means of supporting their work anymore, or, like others that have been delisted, simply contain licenses that have expired and the games don't deserve to fade away because of that. The issue of availability isn't something that's limited to video games either. 
There's a ton of old anime and tokusatsu shows that have never seen the light of day outside of Japan, and the only way to watch them is through fansub sites. Notable examples include the vast majority of the Kamen Rider franchise and the end of Evangelion, which was lucky to be released on Netflix last year, but before that, the only way for an American to obtain it in any legal capacity was to hunt down a DVD that came out in 2002 which would go anywhere from 40 to $100 used, which is flat out unreasonable to anyone who isn't a die-hard fan. Despite being one of the most important and influential anime films of all time, it took 17 years for it to be widely distributed again. And then there's films. I mentioned earlier that video games are still a fairly young form of media, and that older games are at greater risk of being lost. So how do old movies compare? The Library of Congress did their own study and concluded that 75% of silent films are gone. The remaining 25% come in at about 2,749 films in total, which means triple that amount, over 7,500, are lost forever, often due to simple decay, neglect, and even intentional destruction. This doesn't mean old video games will see similar numbers. Unlike film, video games are lucky enough to be born in time for digital media to become prevalent, and therefore backing them up is much easier than making copies of films back in the 1910s and 20s. However, easier methods of backing things up don't matter much when companies simply don't think to do it. And as this video has shown, many didn't. If Konami couldn't keep the source codes of not only two of their best games, but two of the most important games to the entire survival horror genre, then what other games could be lost due to sheer negligence? In summation, as the title of the video states, the video game industry has a preservation problem, and piracy is the answer. Unfortunately, some companies actually can't be relied on to consistently protect their own works, especially smaller companies. Listings are removed due to lack of revenue, licenses are expired, legal issues prevent certain titles from seeing the light of day again, and in the case of older games, source codes are totally lost. To make matters worse, vague, outdated copyright laws only add to the frustration as they were penned before our current internet-dominated age, and heavily favor big corporations that can freely throw their weight around over individual creators. It's easy to just sit back and say, well, whether it's commercially available or not, you're not entitled to it just because it exists, and to be blunt, I think that's bullshit. If a random nobody living in their mother's basement has a deep love for a game like Soul Blazer for the SNES and put the time and effort into maintaining a digital copy, ensuring it works with emulators, and sharing it with others for free, then I think they're more entitled to it than anyone else. Especially considering that the developer, Quintet, no longer exists and likely still owned the IP, so the publisher, Square Enix, can't do anything about it. This concludes my thoughts on video game preservation and piracy. Obviously, it's a subject I care a lot about. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing. I create content about video game news, do occasional reviews, and other discussion videos like this one. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.